Hi, I'm Derek Jensen. This is Resistance Radio and the Progressive Radio Network. My guest today is Elke Dur. She's a filmmaker, author, visual and oral storyteller, fiber artist, photographer, workshop presenter, teacher, and the founder of the nonprofit Web of Life Foundation, WOLF. Elke is the recipient of numerous grants and film awards. She loves to debunk myths and preconceived notions about our animals and natural world and revolutionize the way we see and experience nature. So, I guess to start, can you kind of characterize how um, how you perceive the culture as uh, people in general as being taught to perceive nature, and then move from there to um, how you and many others perceive nature? Thank you for having me, um, Derek, and uh, thanks for this question. I feel that our mainstream culture sees nature as separate from us, as something that we um, we are maybe subjugating, we are using, that's here for us and our needs, but uh, intrinsically that doesn't have its own need. For me, it's different. I am part of nature. I actually just did a film um, about this. It's called I Am Nature, You Are Human Nature nature in human form because i've seen for a long time that we use nature we go out there and we um, take what we need and we feel better for a little bit and then we go back to get more and there's even a film out called nature the new prozac and when i first saw that i thought wow now we've really commoditized nature even more now she is like an antidepressant that we're using when we're not feeling uh, good but how does nature feel? What does nature need from us? Uh, I myself feel that um, I am the outside earth. I am nature in elke form, basically. I am human nature. I'm just a part of it all. I'm not the pinnacle of it all or on top of it all. I'm a part of this. And I'm very aware of it. And what we do to nature, basically, we do to ourselves. Because our bodies even are my, my uh, microcosm of the macrocosm that we have. So, for example, um, we have veins as much as the earth has rivers and streams. And, uh, yeah, our blood vessels are like, like the, the waterways of this earth. So as within, so without. And I feel what we do to the earth, we do to ourselves. And what we do to ourselves, we do to the earth. There's really no separation. And once we get to that point of realizing that life takes on a whole new direction, for me at least it was like that, even though I was never really separate from Earth, but when I really consciously realized who I am and uh, and what my role is on this planet, I life took on a whole different turn. And um, yeah. And I still feel that way to this day. Every day I wake up and I'm, I'm here on this planet, still here. I'm breathing. I feel it is a real gift, and I am not separate from the bigger whole. So, two, two, two questions. One of them is, you talked about a fundamental, a sort of a shift that happened when you realized that. So, either A, can you talk about that shift, or B, can you give us some, some or how did that shift take place? Were there specific interactions with specific non-humans or specific places? Yes, I, one story comes to mind. There's many, but one story comes to mind. When I got my first video camera, I went to um, Yellowstone National Park the next day, and I tried it out. And I went up to this lake, and I saw that there was another camera person there who was um, filming and um, was standing behind this camera. And I went to talk to this person, and he said that uh, there were otters in the area, but to not really uh, get my hopes up high to, to be able to see them. So I got really excited, and I said, oh, there's otters here. I've never seen an otter in person. And I've only heard about them, and I've always wanted to meet them. So where do I find them? And he's like, oh, don't get your hopes up. There won't be any otters. I've been here for a long time looking for them, and they're not coming out, and um, there really is no point in doing this. So 
I tried to make some more talk, small talk with this person, but it didn't go anywhere. So I just sat down at the lake and I, I was really excited. I was happy to be there. I was happy at the prospect, prospect of maybe seeing or hearing some otters. And I was just in tune with everything else and around me. And I was part of everything else. I wasn't separate. So when that person left, I sat down and I zoomed in my camera and I told the otters, wherever they might be, he is gone. You can come out now. And two seconds later, I had to zoom out my camera because all I saw was fur because they came out of the lake right in front of me. And I had no idea where they might exit or where they might be, but they were right there. And I realized that when we see nature or other beings, other animals, because I consider us the human animal, as separate from us, that's when they become an object and we become um, basically uh, above them. We become their, um, their observers. But I became one with everything. And so the animals were fearless. They felt that. And I had the most amazing period filming them for hours and hours, playing and doing everything that otters might do. And uh, it was so amazing. We were one. It felt like I wasn't the spectator. I wasn't uh, the camera operator. I was just part of everything else. And it was really beautiful. And I will never forget that. And... Since then, there have been many incidents like that, but that really brought the point home for me again that we are all one and so connected and I'm not on top of anything or any um, system, that I'm just a part of it. And I thoroughly enjoyed that experience. So what are a couple other examples of when that's happened? Also, I've been making a film about the last Mexican gray wolves in New Mexico and in Arizona. And they are the most endangered land mammal in North America. There's not that many left. And they are the smallest subspecies of the gray wolf. I um, I was camped out one day, and I don't bait the animals, and I don't go after them, and I don't track them, and I don't feed them. Many people that are camera operators or photographers do that for a better um, better um, view of them or to get better footage. But I never do that because it doesn't feel right. It feels like I am jeopardizing them um, by feeding them. And next time I'm gone, somebody else comes along and, does, and, and they go to that person and get shot because um, they're too close to that person. So ethically... I do not like this kind of behavior. So I just sat there and I communicate with the animals. I let them know who I am, what my intentions are. And so that's what I did that day. I put up my tent. I sat there and I communicated who I was and what my intentions were and why I was there. And I was asking for their collaboration and to possibly show themselves to me so I could I could uh, take some footage and put that in the film. And as I was sitting there, it was really interesting. Um, I also had that feeling of being one with everything, not above it, not beneath it, not next to it, but I was I was one with everything. And it sounds very cliche, but that's really how it felt. And I got up and I went to the car and I took out my camping gear and I went to look for a place where I had, I would, was, was going to put up my tent where I had been before and where I had felt that the animals were in the area. So as I was putting up my tent, I had that feeling again, oh, they're here. They've just been here. That's really great. I might see them. And I went back to the car and I stood at the hatchback. And um, I was taking out some more equipment when I felt it again, that there was a presence. And I turned around slowly, and there were four wolves looking at me, checking me out. And I felt the, 
like they were assessing if I was worthy of making a documentary about them. And we looked at each other and I felt this sense of connection again and oneness. And I silently communicated that what, who I was, what was going on, what my intentions were. And we looked each other in the eye and there was a mutual understanding of, yes, this is who we are. And we have both benevolent to each other and all five of us actually. And there's no sense of having to be afraid or anything and that we would be doing this as a co-production, that the wolves would be helping me, or not even helping me, but working with me on this um, documentary. How, how do you feel these um, communications primarily take place? There's different ways. It's nonverbal because they don't understand English. It's mostly with feelings and with pictures in the mind. Sometimes it's also an inner knowing or hearing a message. Um, but for me, it's mostly I get a picture, a very clear picture, and um, I get a knowing in my heart. And I, that's also how I put my questions to them out. So... Um, Basically, it's like I play a movie of, of let's say, my benevolence and uh, why I'm here in my head with pictures and in, also in my heart and convey that to the animals. It's kind of like a telepathic communication and they're doing um, a lot of research on that right now to explain how it really happens. But it's kind of like when... The phone rings and you know who it is that's calling you or even before the phone rings you know that you're getting a call from somebody and who is calling you so it's the same type of um of knowing when i felt them behind me it was a different feeling than i'd ever had um when people were standing behind me for example it was totally different um my hair was standing up on my on my body um, because I, mean, I got goosebumps because it was this feeling of total wildness of like some some instinctual um, being right behind me and, and I knew that they were there before I even turned around and when I turned around lo and behold they were standing there so it's, there's different ways to communicate and we all do that um, and we all have been doing that since childhood. It's, it's our birthright. It's not something that we can really learn. It's more like something that we can unearth and reaffirm again because we have been doing it as children, but then we have been told, no, it's not possible, and you're a dreamer, do something that, uh, that makes sense with your life. The animal communication or inner species communication, as I call it, um, that's not really real and you can't make a living with that. So all these things have been put into our heads with the so-called education that's prevalent in our society, in our Western society. So we sort of put it away. Um, but now I find that when I travel and do presentations and film presentations, for example, a lot of young people come to me and they often give up their recess or their lunchtime to talk to me and say, I, I talk to the animals as well, but my parents say, say it's not possible or um, I've always done this my whole life. And so it's just a matter often of reaffirming that old skill in us, that old ability that's ancient because our ancestors of old were able to do that as well. But we have let it atrophy a little bit. So now it's coming back and I'm meeting a lot of um, especially young people who are wonderful <coughs> communicators. When I when I was in the run-up to me writing the book that became a language older than the words, the first version of that book was supposed to be about interspecies communication. And, um, and one of the things that, and I started asking a lot of people if they had had, um, examples of interspecies communication. And a lot of people had, 
and it was all just like you said that they would sort of whisper it to me um, and they would say I've never told this story in public so what got me really excited then was the dissonance between public and private discourse about it. If you ask a lot of people if they've ever had any sort of significant conversation with a non-human, they'll tell you about their dogs or their cats, or they'll tell you about these times in their life that were really moving to them. And then if you ask them, have you told that story in public, almost every time they'll say no. Yes. Because, because everybody will make fun of them. Yes, correct. Yeah, that's what I'm still getting as well but if we all knew how many of us have had these experiences then we wouldn't be so shy about it anymore so part of my job is really to bring that out in people and to make it more normal in in uh, the public eye basically because it's such a wonderful um, ability that's been given to us and why let it atrophy because we don't have to handle animals and um, let's say um, trap them and sedate them and put a collar on them uh, to get de- data from from them. We can just communicate with them and observe them and be with them and get the same data or maybe even ac- more accurate data, I'm guessing. So by normalizing it more, uh, I feel like there's a there's a gift that's coming back to us that will make our life a lot more rich than it has been because we have been so disconnected. And uh, once we uh, admit to ourselves that this is possible, then life becomes so much more uh, multidimensional than we could ever imagine and so much richer. Two things. One of them is so many indigenous people have said to me that the biggest difference between Western and indigenous ways of being is that um, Western society is based on perceiving the world as consisting of resources to be exploited as other being as opposed to other being centered relationship with and indigenous perspectives are that the world is composed of other beings um, whose lives are as valuable to them as yours is to you and mine is to me, other beings who have their own unique intelligences. And do you, do you, I, you know, I, I see bears every day. I see them all the time. And, Different bears have completely different personalities and they have different preferences and some are shy and some are gregarious and some it's, it's true with dogs. It's true with everybody. And can you, can you tell any stories about different personalities or, or, or different personalities between different species too? Yeah. Um, the last six years I've been, um, dividing my time between Montana and New Mexico and anywhere else in between. And uh, last year I spent eight months in a tent on the ground in these areas just to be with the animals because it's very important to me to for them to have a person who comes to them and says, what do you need? Who are you? What would you like to share? Instead of them always having to flee from us in terror because we're such a threat to them because we're always armed, at least with bear spray, if not with other weapons. And we, um, we uh, often use those weapons. And so, uh, I spend a lot of time with the animals and I do see distinct personalities and, um, uh, in them and also maybe even different jobs that they're, they're doing within the whole ecosystem. And, um, even within a family structure let's say the wolves what some of them like the mother and the father of a family are often the breadwinners that go out and um and get the deer or the elk and teach the others to to hunt as well whereas there's also like babysitters just that stay with the yearlings or the youngsters and protect them so there's distinct personalities and i remember from the wolves um 
these babysitters have to contend with a lot of mischief from the, from the little ones. And I remember one day, one little one was especially mischievous and was tucking at the ear of the um, babysitter, I call the other wolf that was there with them, t- taking care of them, and biting them in the ear or in the nose and scratching and doing all kinds of stuff until the adult wolf had enough of it, put his paw on the um, tail of the little one, and when he wanted to run, he couldn't. And uh, when he had enough momentum, he let go of the tail, and the little one was tumbling down, <laughs> tumbling down the hill. It was just so cute to see uh, that they have a sense of humor, that they play, especially with the otters. I saw a lot of that. Again, there's probably different roles that they um, take within the family, but there were so many different personalities, and I would say there's there's one there's uh, individuals that are more shy than others, um, um, more bold bolder ones, and um, and also um, more curious ones. Because I remember also this one wolf family came by and showed me their offspring. <laughs> they had seven puppies at that time, whereas and uh, the sad thing is. Half of them died during the first year, but um, they still had seven of their original litter, and um, they were all different. They were all different in, in terms of size and what they looked like and uh, how bold they were or how shy they were or how they stayed with the mother or how they ventured out. And I could almost tell then, uh, from looking at certain individuals that they would be the ones maybe lo- leaving the family and looking for maiden territory. So yes, I've seen a lot of that. And then also in terms of different species, I would say, for example, the otters are very playful ones and they never attack any other um species, maybe to defend themselves or to fish. That's when they get the fish. But other than that, they're very gentle and playful um, as a whole species. That's how I have seen them. Whereas other species, maybe like the bison, I also did a documentary about the last wild bison in the Northern Hemisphere and migrated with them for four years. You know, they come across as very powerful and they're also playful. They're uh, calves oh, for the sheer joy of it. <laughs> they are just running around and kicking and and doing all kinds of antiques just for the sheer joy of being alive. And I've seen that in so many species, if not all of them, that um, there's a certain playfulness. So, yes, there are distinct personalities, I would say. So what... What um, what do you think the dominant uh, worldview of perceiving them as as not sentient beings um, is doing to uh, most importantly the planet and secondarily to us? Well, since we are part of it all, it's also hurting us because. Um, it's almost, you know, it's the same with us. Um, we are sentient beings, but we are not using so many of our abilities uh, are dormant. And um, so it's the same. It's the same with us. We've, we are kind of in a dormant state almost. And that's really hurting the planet because as soon as we see what's really going on and um, and get out of our little convenient way of seeing life as um, to be harvested or to be uh, consumed, um, we will see that that everything is sentient and that we are hurting ourselves by hurting others. And especially the way we do the factory farming or we do the so-called hunting or we do even agriculture is a big point too as well because we don't ascribe anything else to our plant food uh, than um, than being food and uh, being dead basically. But even plants are alive and they don't want to be in rows and in monocultures and they don't want to be sprayed. 
and uh, they are so intricate and so evolved. I just read that flowers, when they to, to, when they sense bees or to attract bees, um, they can hear them, and then they uh, they send out even more. Um, um, what would you call it? Aroma to attract these bees to be pollinated. So even a plant that we would look at as really basic is very, very complicated and intricate. And uh, I also just recently heard that they did research that plants scream uh, basically on a frequency that we don't hear when um, when there's danger or when they are being eaten or or cut down. So uh, even though we don't hear any of that and we don't sense it because we have sort of shut down and we are so dormant in our sensory perception these days and um, even um, I would go as far as to say a sedated often, um, it exists and we are hurting ourselves because we are destroying our very home, our very beautiful earth and yes we need to eat yes we need to live somewhere but it all can be done differently if we don't have to clear cut everything um we can take it i I know of certain a certain logging company they are very mindful in the way they log and they get 10 times more out of every tree as other companies who are just uh, using trees as if there's no tomorrow. So we can do this in a mindful way. It's not like we have to shut ourselves in a cave or not eat or not do anything. No, it's just how we do it. And there's so many different ways of doing this life on earth um, that I'm very excited about that are now coming out that are much more mindful and sustainable, even though this word has been overused. But um, uh, the bottom line is that um, we are thinking of, we are starting to think of the earth and our home as as our home and a living being, a sentient being altogether. And that uh, means there are certain things we can't do anymore because they're hurtful to the whole system that we are part of. So I'm very excited about these new developments and um, and I'm very hopeful for the future. So if somebody's listening to this interview and they live in an apartment in suburban Atlanta, Georgia or or if they live um, out in the wilds in Appalachia somewhere um, what 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 can they do? How, how does somebody start um, to open up in this way if you're not a child and it has been trained out of you and you're now 27 or 34 or 47? What, what, how do you, what, what should they do to start changing their perspective? Really go out there, no matter where we are. Um, actually, I've been told that there's more diversity now in the cities in terms of pollinators because often it doesn't get sprayed there so um, because there's a human high human density so just get out and reacquaint yourself with that child that you were a long time ago and I was really looking at every bug turning over every rock and uh, remember who you were back then because it's still in you and really find that joy again. You know, it doesn't have to be the wild. It doesn't have to be, um, you know, a huge park or whatever. It can be a flower growing out of a crack in the asphalt. That's really um, getting your attention. Just really pay attention to your surroundings and where you live and who else lives there. It could be a bear, it could be a bug, it could be a, a falcon, whatever is around you. Just just look and see who else is there with you in your ecosystem that you are living in and see what their role is. And it will instill a lot of joy in you. I've seen that in many people when we find that again because it's a lot of enthusiasm 
that comes along with with being in nature and observing nature. And then from there on out, it'll be very easy to find a way to be of service to those creatures. And I'm always saying that, you know, because people say, oh, you work with the charismatic ones like the bears and the wolves. But it's not true. I love them all. <laughs> and I work with all of them because they're all very, very important. A bee is just as important as a wolf because um, most of our food gets pollinated by um, by pollinators and bees. So they're all important. And be it hummingbirds, be it bees, you will find a way to be of service to them and to make sure that they um, they can exist um, and that they can thrive in your ecosystem where you're living. And it doesn't really matter where it is. We often think, oh, we have to go to the wild. We have to go to the wilderness. We have to build a house in the wilderness. Well, that often is is worse because then we, we plop down some building on the calving ground of the elk or um or we uh we scare away the bear that used to live there because we have dogs that chase after them so it's not necessarily uh, better to be in the wilderness it depends you know it depends on um our level of awareness and unconsciousness because the more conscious we are about our neighbors and what they need the better of a neighbor we will be to them so somebody in their apartment um, goes into the bathroom and they're going to take a shower and they see that in the upper left corner of the shower there's a little spider with a web Mm. so take the scenario from there I mean how (laughs) normally they may have either killed the spider or or not have noticed it but now having noticed it what what Remember, you're you're going against several thousand years of training. And yes. Personally, you know, <laughs> decades of, of training. So, so, okay. So I see a spider in the corner of my shower. What, what am I supposed to do now? Yeah, that's the thing. The more we wake up, the less we can do things that we've always done, like squish the spider and proceed to take a shower. Once we are aware of how important all the other players in the ecosystem are, we can't do these things anymore because it doesn't feel right anymore. So I would say it depends on the human and where they are at the moment. If there's still fear of spiders instilled in them because that's very common because that's what we've been told forever, how dangerous spiders are, um, as opposed to many Native American stories where spiders are revered because they were uh, weaving together the earth and we learned from them how to weave and how how to um, basically be very still and wait for our food to come to us, which is very different from this fearful way of seeing them. Um, now it depends on us. Can we do this? Can we... Can we maybe get a glass and a piece of paper and gently take the spider out? And uh, if it's not winter, or can we say, okay, um, I can still take a shower. It's in the upper corner and I'm on the, the other end. You know, I can maybe leave the spider here until it gets warmer and I can take the spider out. Even though I've been told too that spiders who were raised basically or or uh, who hatched in the house um, are not that um, well suited for the outside but I'm still taking the spiders out when I can so there's something about our consciousness what is it telling us and uh, also what's what's really being asked of us right now is to have some courage to not always go with the grain to go against it sometimes and swim against the current and, and go with what we, we ourselves uh, know to be true in our hearts. And that's very important right now that we, that we become more courageous and talk about these things, talk about communication with animals and other species, talk about um, taking the spiders out of the house, talk about not swatting every mosquito, but maybe using some, um, 
repellent oil on our skin or something. There's so many other ways. You know, we've been taught, taught to kill, kill, kin, kill. And I remember that as a child too. Um, I grew up in Germany post World War II. And there was absolutely no consciousness about animals. It was all about survival and, uh, and, uh, building the country back up. So when, um, there was talk about there maybe being rabies in a preemptive strike, they were killing all the foxes with poisons, guns and traps and, um, and noxious fumes. And I remember I was a little child. And I knew the foxes because after school, I was always sitting with them in front of the den and, uh, they would show me their, their litter. They would show me their cubs and, they, and I knew them. I wasn't touching them or whatever, but we lived, uh, lived life, uh, our lives together. And I remember occupying the fox dens as a child and saying, no, over my dead body, will you kill my foxes? Of course, they carried me away or they waited till I fell asleep or something. And uh, they did what they wanted anyways. But um, but I stood up for them right then and there already. And I think it's very important to have the courage these days to stand up for what we love and what we know to be true. And I think... I think that's really important, the notion of um, seeing non-human neighbors as your neighbors and friends as opposed to seeing them as um, either pests or, um, or background or or seeing them as at best some sort of exotic being that shows up and you can get all excited to see them through the window which yeah. is better than the others yeah but yeah it's but also so, yeah it's also a disconnection you know to see them through the window yeah or to take pictures with them to be special And I keep thinking about how we evolved hearing all these other non-humans and seeing them. I read many years ago that if somebody was near a river in California, they would see a grizzly bear every 15 minutes. Oh. And, um, and I consider myself lucky to see a few bears every day. They're not grizzlies, they're black bears. And just how, um, you know, I, I think about this a lot, that, that we can all name various advertising jingles or, or people of a certain age can still remember the theme song from Gilligan's Island, but how few of us, myself included, can name the same number of bird songs or can identify um, flowers or trees or any of uh, any of our neighbors it's we don't we're living in a giant echo chamber where where all we see is is made of is made by humans and that's uh, I think that messes us up yeah. Yeah, when you talk about our neighbors, you know, we, we put the neighbors there. You know, we often take down whole ecosystems just to put in a lawn. <laughs> or we, we bring our ecosystem with us, you know, our dogs and cats and, um, and they have the upper hand over any wild animal. If, if there's a mountain lion coming close, we have them removed or we have the bear removed if they take an apple from the tree. So, yeah, in, in favor of those that we, um, th those life forms that we deem worthy. And this is a good point because we live in this binary society, wolf or dog, 
wheat or vegetable, bison or cattle. And we have decided who is worth, who's worth it and who isn't and who needs to die, who can live and who needs to die. Um, you know, according to our preferences. If we can use the animal, sell the animal, wear the animal, eat the animal, then it's useful. And a wolf is useless because um, we can't do anything with the wolf. And what's wor- what's worse, the wolf might take a sheep or, um, or um, a cow from our herd. So we are the ones who are deciding <laughs> what, what can live and what needs to die. And that's also a very dangerous uh, vantage point to come from. It'd be really good to look at what really thrives in nature. I just read yesterday there is a person in uh, New Zealand and they just um, let nature take over again in areas that were severely overgrazed by cattle. And it looks really beautiful now. Again, nature took over in 30 years. It got rehabilitated. So nature knows best what grows and what should be there. And um, it would be great for us to take some time out of our hectic schedule. And I don't know why the schedule always has to be so hectic, because when I was with Grandma, her schedule definitely wasn't like that, even though she worked a lot too. But she always took the time to watch nature and to see what was growing naturally and what was thriving and how it was thriving, and she took great pleasure from that. And I think that would that would really benefit us to see who those neighbors are that are thriving and allowing them to thrive instead of insisting on removing them and putting somebody else there. So we have about four or five minutes left, and I have two questions for you. One of them is, how did you... If most of us have this as children, how did you not lose it? And the second question is, how do, if people are interested in your work, how can they find out more about it? Thank you so much for these questions because somebody else just asked me that. For some reason, I insisted on... uh, on being myself and not losing these things because everything else that was offered to me didn't make sense. And I just talked to my dad about that. I said, Dad, what was the hardest thing about raising me? And he said, you just wouldn't take our advice on uh, what to become (laughs) and who to be. You just insisted on staying who you were. And um, now he said, I see the, the value of that. But back then I thought you will never make it in this life because um because you're so different and you're insisting on on caring for all other life forms which we thought was really silly and not possible so i hung on to it but also because i had a grand great grandmother who was um a healer and completely connected and she was with me the first 4 years of my life life and uh, she always sit me on her on her in her lap and um and tell me stories or just be with me and she also never caved in when society wanted her to take a different turn she always stayed herself too and i attribute that to her that i had an easier time staying myself and not going a different route and then back tracking and if somebody would like to um, uh, get in touch with me, you can go to my website. I started the Web of Life Foundation. You find that under www.weboflifefoundation.net. And then also my personal website, www.elkedur.com, E-L-K-E-D-U-E-R-R. Dot com. Um, I do a lot of animal communication sessions with people and their their pets and also with people who would like to um, build a home in the wilderness and are curious about their neighbors that are there and wondering about the best place to put their home and how to 
best coexist with their wild neighbors that have been there long before they came. And uh, you can also find my videos, my wolf film, and some other films like I Am Nature or My Happy People, um, A Message from the Earth on Vimeo under my name, El Kidur on Vimeo. And again, it's E-L-K-E, which is elk with an E in the end, and last name D-U-E-R-R. That's how you can find me on Vimeo. And uh, thank you so very much um, for your interest in my work. Uh, it's my dream come true. And uh, all this has changed so much since I was a child. There's so much more interest in our, our neighbors now and the rest of the world and so much more awareness coming. Well, thank you for that. And we were going to end, except now I have another question. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I'm gonna tell, and this has to be really short for both of us. Okay. I'm gonna tell a really cosmic story, and then I'm gonna ask you to tell a really cosmic story. Okay. Um, so my mom, there was one bear in particular that my mom especially had a tremendous relationship with. Um, she could go out on the porch, and the bear would show up, and this bear we called Mama, and my mom knew this bear for years, and eventually, um, the bear moved to another territory. And we didn't see her for years. We thought maybe she died. We didn't know. And then last year, my mom was dying of cancer. And about two weeks before my mom entered terminal delirium, um, so she's still still functional at this point, um, Mama shows up and sits on the porch for about a week. And... Um, both of us... I mean, that, that was very, very moving. My mom said either she's coming to tell me I'm going to I'm going to get better or she's coming to tell me goodbye and I said I I think she's telling coming to tell you that everything is going to be okay no matter what and anyway so so my mom had a very close intimate relationship with this bear and um very good friends and then when the bear somehow found out my mom was dying the bear came back so now it's your turn for a cosmic story <laughs> I'll stay with the bear. I always have a bear song that I sing when I go into the wild and when I hike. And I was singing my bear song that day uh, so that the bears knew know who I am and uh, can feel my spirit and can go away if they want or stay if they want. Um, but anyways, I was singing my bear song and I was going around the corner. And this one particular bear had had opted to stay there and take a risk. It was a male grizzly standing up on his hind legs eating berries. And it's the cutest thing in the coolest thing in the world because they're eating these tiny little, little berries. And he was, um, he was showing me his profile. He wasn't looking at me because the bears know, you know, we feel like it's a sign of aggression if they look at us directly. So I saw this bear standing right in front of me eating berries and kind of glancing at me. And I said, from the bottom of my heart, unpremeditated, I said, oh, thank you. I love you. Thank you for being on the mountain. It's so important that you're here. The mountain is not the same without you. I love you. I love you. And the bear turned around and looked at me. And in that moment, there was a connection through, uh, through our eyes because we were looking at each other. And at that moment, we both threw overboard what our mothers had told us about each other. Run, run. And we gave it a chance. And I, I had this, this, um, throwback to a long time ago when we were still connected with nature. And I looked at him and I said, bear, bear, that's what a bear is. And he looked at me and he felt like woman, woman, that's what a true woman is. And we both got so excited that this was possible to make contact in a non-threatening non-afraid way with all this love and I felt love from the bear and I sent him love and I turned around because I didn't want to take pictures or, or milk that situation and I said goodbye to him and I kept on walking and he kept on eating and to this day I feel him thinking of me that with all this hope for the future of the bear nation that this humans that are benevolent towards them 
Well, thank you so much for all your work, and thank you for being on the program, and I would like to thank listeners for listening. My guest today has been Elka Dur. This is Derek Jensen for Resistance Radio on the Progressive Radio Network.